Reimagining Success, episode 287. And there are so many nuggets in this last minute spontaneous interview that I did with the very lovely Verity Baldry. And we talked about how difficult it is to make a decision about your career when you're younger and how we make that pivot later on, how we kind of keep our options open while still building on that traditional definition of success in terms of status perhaps and something that feels like more of a expected route taking that leap then into doing something else and looking at this idea of being a fractional in this case fractional chief of staff that Verity um, has in a sense created for herself but it's such a great fit for her fantastic background Um, and we of course dive into as well how to make it work for you so work-life integration in more practical terms so you're going to love this one enjoy Welcome to Reimagining Success, your compass for navigating a world where the traditional nine to five no longer fits our needs or aspirations. I'm your host, Anna Lundberg, former corporate insider turned business mentor, executive coach, and mum of two, here to guide you as you craft a career and a life that's filled with freedom, flexibility, and fulfillment. Join me as I uncover actionable strategies, share inspirational stories, and equip you with the tools to thrive in today's evolving workplace. Ready to redefine success? Let's get started. Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to this month's interview and I'm here with Verity Baldry. And Verity and I met online, I suppose we still haven't met in person unfortunately, but hopefully that will still come as things often go via a connector who then introduced me to Verity and we had a lovely project together and which we can um, maybe if it's relevant talk about later, but I'm really happy to have Verity on and she's very graciously stepped in to help me out and I know that her story is an interesting one. So welcome Verity and could you please tell us a little bit more about what your career history has been like and what you're doing today? Uh, thanks for having me. It's um it's it's been a it's been a, a a swift decision hasn't it um so i have spent uh, the best part of 20 years working at a venture builder called blenheim chalcott what a venture builder means uh, in the blenheim chalcott world is either starting businesses within the group or bringing external businesses in and growing and scaling them and i described my role at blenheim chalcott was like a guy who had you know somebody had to, you know a hand on my collar like the Google map was just a man dropping me in and it's kind of the drop and run and go. So I traversed businesses uh, within the Blenheim Chalcott group. Loads of fun, lots of different experiences. I felt like my CV was uh, the worst CV in the world, especially for somebody of my kind of generation, because uh, I did all sorts. I, I did project management, I did consultancy, I did product management, commercial stuff, business development, you know, kind of whatever it takes in that startup world. Uh, and I left in the pandemic. Uh, and uh, went off and did an MA in creative and life writing, which I now think of as the antidote to nearly 20 years spent in startup in that quite frenetic environment. Uh, and then since then, I have been working uh, fractionally, which we can talk about uh, for myself recently, uh, just coming up for my first year uh, working for Cheerful Orange. So I call myself a fractional chief of staff, which is a title that is very flexible and allows me to offer all of those skills and completely make sense of that CV back from uh, Blenheim Chalcott. So I work with CEOs and founders in early stage businesses to help them establish their businesses and grow and scale them, um, you know, doing those kind of um, right hand special projects uh, you know, anything that, that a founder needs. And if it's not me, then it's normally somebody I know from my network because they are the people, um, they're the people that I have, uh, you know, from my career. And yeah, let's definitely dig into that. As of curiosity, if we go way back to the beginning, how did you end up in that career? Was that a very intentional career path coming out of education or, or how did you end up there in the first place? So I went into education saying, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, so I went off uh, to uni and did a management sciences degree thinking, ha ha, here we go. I'll do all of these different modules in HR logistics. It was, you know, some stat stuff. It was everything, operational stuff. And I thought by the time I get to the end of it, I'll know what I want to do. And I did really, if I specialised in anything, I did a lot of the small business modules. So I really enjoyed, you know, the business planning side of it. But you don't graduate into anything that looks like that. So uh, I graduated into um, a role with Morgan Stanley. Uh, and I went down to Canary Wharf 
in investment banking doing South African equity settlements, thinking, not really sure what this is, but I'll give it a go. And I hated it. Absolutely hated it. I feel like I'm, you know, slightly allergic to Canary Wharf just for that environment. It's not me. It could never have been me. Um, but I suppose I felt like that was the conventional thing. And, you know, like project management was a, a, a module that I did on my degree, but it didn't exist in the world. There were no project management jobs. Um, so I feel like, you know, kind of the thing that I knew I was going to be good at wasn't available in the world at the time when I did it. Um, so I didn't last long at Morgan Stanley. Uh, my sister, uh, you know, very helpfully uh, pulled me into some stuff that she was doing at the Department for Work and Pensions at the time, which was on values and culture change, which was really fun. And from there, I got my role with Agelisys, which was one of the first biggest businesses within Blenheim Chalcot. So because I had the government experience and because they were winning government contracts, I mean, I was central government, they were looking for local, but it didn't seem to matter. You know, uh, they were looking for people um, that could come in and kind of grow. And then I grew through Agilisys and then, you know, outside of Agilisys through the rest of the group. Um, it, it, in my career, when I had children, I switched more into business development than direct client delivery stuff and um, to try and get that flexibility. Um, which is funny because that flexibility was, you know, sort of still finishing at five, maybe going home, dinner, bath and bed with the kids, but then starting again later. So, um, you know, it was fairly full on the idea that I was, you know, kind of um, more flexible. And it, and it was, you know, and, and my colleagues were very, uh, very kind, you know, to sort of allow that asynchronous working, although actually it benefited us a lot when we were, you know, sort of doing the big bid work. We doubled um, Agilis this year on year with the, you know, the bids that we were doing then. So it was great time, but it was really hard work. Um, and when I stepped out of Agilisys, that was where I was like, I think I want to be, you know, kind of doing the small business. Agilisys was too big for me by then, it felt. Um, and really that's a pattern that's repeated. So the last role that I had within the Blend Chocolate Group was with Salary Finance. And by the time I'd been there four and a bit years, you know, it was global, big investment, you know, lots of people and less fun so I know that my heart is in that sort of small business uh you know kind of best definitely the fast growing stuff um but for me there was no easy access you know no like you know I mean I'm now calling myself a chief of staff that's a thing that didn't exist you know previously um I think really all I want is something that's elastic enough to say what's fun you know let's go I call myself a conjurer if I call myself anything it's a thing that says what what do we think this looks like? How do we go from here to here? Um, you know, and and setting off without really even, you know, knowing whether you can get to the end. That's the bit that um I find really motivating. One of my um favorite sayings is at first it's impossible, then it's difficult, then it's done. Mm -hmm. And I learned that while we were building the community center. So it was really, you know, that was one I I lived on a daily basis, just uh uh, I didn't mention that, did I? My my career thing. One of my and roles um, was I did a, a a project to to build a community centre locally, which is something that was really important to me at the time. And it felt impossible, and it really looked impossible. And then actually, we were doing it, and and didn't you know didn't think we were ever going to get to the end of it. And now it's done, and there's you know there's natural building there. So that that really epitomises the the kind of way that I work and the kind of things that I enjoy doing. And I think startup is it's a whole environment that gives a lot of opportunity, a lot of scope for those kind of that that sort of flexible um, job description, mm. even if it's not necessarily flexible work. Mm. Gosh, I want to say so many things now. I love that, first of all, the impossible, because things can, when, when the starting a podcast, we were just talking about, you know, you've never done it before. It seems completely overwhelming. Well, even going on a podcast is the first step. And yet, as soon as you start breaking it down, okay, it becomes tricky and challenging and difficult. This is by far not as complicated as growing a business, but just as the example that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, before you know, you have actually done it, but things yeah. that just seem like a far off goal, it's it's just not possible to, to um, visualize how that could become more real. It sounds like you've been too good at your job and you've grown the business just too much. And to <laughs> the point that, you know, oh dear, too successful now for me, I need to, to move on somewhere else I can't take full credit for that at all whatsoever I'm only ever a cog in a machine rather than a um you know taking the the leadership role and stuff really 
But it sounds also like you have that self-awareness. And I think this multi-potentialite sort of umbrella portfolio and fractional idea is so, so appealing to people like us, if I can lump myself in that bracket as well. My degree was very much, I wanted to study as much as possible to keep my options open. I didn't really know. And I think who does know at that age, it's really tricky. Um, but with that self-awareness and so how did you look at success when you were coming out of education? Do you feel like you adjust, as you said, you know, yeah, this is the kind of job that I should be taking. Um, as a parenthesis, the other point I wanted to pick up on before it goes away from my brain is this interesting thing that these jobs didn't exist when you were studying. And obviously we talk now about AI and all the things, the stats, whatever it is, 80% of jobs won't exist in 20 years and 80% of jobs that will exist don't exist today, which sounds like it was also the case already there. So anyway, my question was, how did you look at success then and how has it changed? I think success used to be very status oriented and money driven when I was leaving university. So, you know, Morgan Stanley was one of the top jobs that was available. You know, it was the sort of mum and dad be proud of me badge. I mean, I interview a lot of um, graduates and, and you know, junior um, staff now for a lot of the roles that I do. And they're like, start up. It's so brilliant. And my mom and dad are delighted. And I'm just like, I, if I'd have gone straight into a startup, my dad would have had a heart attack. You know, it, it, it would have just been like the riskiest thing. It, it's a bit like, you know, some some families would never entertain the thought of their children going into the arts or, you know, if anybody said, I want to be, you know, a music producer or something, they'd have been encouraged to go off and do maths probably. Um, so I think, you know, the guessing the, the you know definition of success was that status role which was big company lots of money um and when I let go of that it started becoming you know more fun but I didn't know I just knew it wasn't that I didn't know that it was a new thing or a different thing and as I say you know kind of working in startup wasn't seen as a as the groovy thing that it is now you yeah, know well it's a really starry-eyed about getting into startups aren't they and and the scope and the possibility um, I think it was very much seen as something that was like, well, you're never going to get a pension and, you know, there'll never be any mat leave and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you work loads of hours for no money. Why would you bother? You know, and the company may fail as well. I mean, all those things are, you know, probably still true, but at least now the understanding of um, the flexibility, the variety, the sort of the well-rounded experience that you can get, I think is a lot more attractive to people than going into a corporate role or, you know, the grad training scheme at Morgan Stanley. I mean, back office equity settlements for the South African market wasn't going to give me life skills, I'm pretty sure. Yes. <laughs> Maybe that's just square pegs and round holes. I don't know. Yes. So I, I just, I, I have a very different definition of success now some of that is that I'm further on in my career and I've got that experience behind me that's in the bank and I want to be able to leverage that but some of that is that I you know I have a a more grown-up family and I have uh, you know kind of um more more thoughts about you know I'm 20 years into my career with probably 20 years left um and success for me is more about fun and interesting uh it's more about um variety having autonomy having you know, creating mastery, being able to to do new things and take more risks uh, for fun rather than for necessity. Um, and that, I think, has been more of a joy to be able to, to, to experience. I'm very privileged because I don't have to chase a paycheck in the way that I used to um, need to. And, you know, some of that uh, working as hard as I did and saving money as hard as I did is then the platform that gives me the now. So I don't think I could necessarily put my definition of success back to, to my younger self or, you know, vice versa. I think it morphs and changes as you, as you, you know, kind of meet each different part of your life. And it's such a robust background to have then, to have that already the big company and the status and the, and the income to be able to make those creative choices later. I think I heard um, Gary Vaynerchuk talking about how actually when you're young is the moment when you should take the risks, you've got nothing to lose, which is true. But then I wonder, you know, if you do that, then do you not gain the experience? You know, maybe you're burned and then you kind of go back to, comfort zone and stay there forever I don't know I mean there's probably no right answer but it's an interesting and anyway we can't go back in a time machine and change the choices we made so you know it's too late for us the only question is now for all of us and for listeners what do we want to do now going forwards and when you made the decision then to leave you mentioned it was during the pandemic was that a big 
life audit reset or was it just coincidental how did you make that decision then to go off on your own um I'd already felt like the role that I had wasn't um wasn't the one that I was really excited about having because it you know was was a a, at that point small cog in a very very big machine um and so when redundancies were offered going into the pandemic that was a good opportunity I suppose um I guess I'd have loved to have stayed in the Blenheim Chalcott group and started again but you know that wasn't the environment and it's still not the environment really I mean startup is tough mm-hmm. um and in all honesty I think I, you know that first kind of what well, it's 17 years was exhausting and I didn't realize how exhausted I was and when I stopped and you know we all took a breather in the pandemic didn't we doing that um that MA, Creative and Life Writing, it was poetry. It was nuts. I've never, you know, I did sciences at A level and um, at university. That gave me the insight that I, you know, I think to be able to burn as fast as I had for as long as I had, I had to to, to close down a lot of that. Those, um, you know, you're in survival mode a bit. I mean, you know, but when you've got the young kids and you're doing the school runs and the pat lunches, I know we talked about that the other day, didn't we? Like, it's just the hamster wheel. And when you when you get the ability to stop, which is, you know, lucky that I had that because otherwise I, I might just carried on. It was my one mode and I'd never really questioned it. Um, that I then went and kind of nourished the creative side. I then had that moment of, well, I don't want to lose that. I don't want that to look like the, you know, kind of midlife crisis in the pandemic. I'm a woman of a certain age. It's a risk. Uh, and it might have been that who knows uh but there's nothing that you know kind of I, I realized that that is something that I need to keep doing to have that balanced um whole self but actually startup was my love so I, I went back and took a role thinking you know I'm back on back on the um the wagon again that was where we met you know startup forever oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then with the environment as it is you know that role wasn't sustainable for me for the long term um at which point I just wondered whether I'd retired like I left there and thought you know there's not a lot out there what do I do um and I knew about you I knew about your your book and your podcast I had that in my arsenal I had a really um lovely friend who was who said the word fractional to me because I was saying I'd you know kind of do I go back and get a or do I do part-time now do I do I go wrap back around the wheel on is it startup is it poetry you know how do I manage those two things and she said fractional I thought fantastic so it's the best rebranding of you know consult uh, you know like contracting or you know part-time or you know interim it's kind of all of those things it can be anything that you want it to be I would never if somebody had said to me go freelance I would have said no Mm. that's scary Uh, but somebody said fractional and I thought oh that's interesting I could work fractionally um and, you know, the, the breaking it down into small steps bit, I was then like, well, that's really awkward. I don't know how I'm going to, you know. And she sort of said, well, just set up a company, do it from within inside a company, you know, because otherwise I was a little bit like Verity Baldry Services Limited. I'm selling myself like that solopreneuring kind of you are selling yourself, but you need not to feel so, so quite flayed <laughs> bare to the world of, you know, um, you know, the the kind of the promotion of it. Um, so gradually, step by step, I kind of worked with the idea of you know the chief of staff the fractional thinking about what the startup market's doing whether you know people can't afford they need the expertise but they can't afford it um and so then I thought well if I have 20 years left to use the operator experience that I've got you know kind of maybe in the future I go towards advising maybe I start investing you know kind of maybe that's the way that I go on the journey with uh with startup without having to be in the kind of bleeding from my eyeballs nailed onto the rocket ship sort of uh, approach to startup um and that then coalesced really quickly for me actually into something that felt quite nice uh, cheerful orange was uh, a business name that i came up with so many years ago now but, uh, you know i've been asked quite a few times like oh how did you come up with a name um i was sat uh kind of thinking about virgin as a brand and you know those brands that can be anything and i was thinking i just need one of those you know and then if i ever have a, a business in the future um and i don't know how i got to cheerful orange but i loved it and i bought the domains for it and then it's been my guilty shame sort of year on year every time it's renewed i think oh no so you know like why am i spending money on this so when i got to that moment of okay i think i can do this i think i can work for myself i think i can make a plan i think it can be a fractional chief of staff i think it could be cheerful orange and there we go so 9th of may was when we um when i incorporated there's, there's a we here it's, it's me and cheer bear if you want to see how i this is my 
Oh, that's that's the company. Oh, I love that's my wife with that guy. <laughs> me, me and Chirba. Uh yeah, so that was um that was that uh, you know, kind of thought process that then mm tipped me into doing this and I've been lucky because it's it's just talking to people isn't it I mean you say this you know it's not going out and doing this big marketing branding thrusting yourself forward it's actually going around and speaking to people and finding out what their needs are and seeing if you can help and that's been I've been lucky that I've had those people in my network that are businesses and yeah would like to work together and and that's kept me out of mischief really Mm. And and what then is the difference between, is it just a mindset thing between being a freelancer, contractor, veritybaldry.com kind of solopreneur? Um, as you said, how have you been going about kind of with the business development? How has it for people listening who are like, oh, I don't even know how to begin. How do I become fractional? How do I sort of tell people I'm available? How does it work? I think there's, I think it's a personal thing because I know there are fractional um uh, like slack channels that you can join i'm in mean, a couple uh you know there's there's lots of now um you know blogs or whatever you know out there for the, the fractional um industry some people will do fractional as in two days a week in one business and three days a week in another mm-hmm. um, and you know they may do that kind of forever or they might do that you know the two day a week is for the next three months and the three day a week is the, and they're constantly trying to stitch the ends of them together or they're trying to kind of make a week between you know different commitments um, and I think that's that. It, that's a really nice approach because you get that variety. You get, you know, being fractional, you you see lots of different businesses, and you can actually transfer all the best practice across them. You know, you come up with something once, and you take it to a different business, and it's you know, um, fits the purpose. And what do you know? You've been able to turn up and add value easily. So that you know, that's one way of doing it. I do it more. At, well, and I offer that. Of course, I do. I can also be. Um, on a retainer as and when I can do hourly for certain stuff where I can just literally do work packages and that's for me like the ultimate kind of fractional because I'm like fractions on fractions <laughs> kind mm-hmm. of the way that I can work um, to balance uh, the different clients that I have but that also allows me I did start looking at the investing maybe a bit earlier than I thought I would um because I'm I realized that um so there's awful awful stats out there about investing only two percent of um money goes into female founded businesses that goes up to 17 percent if they've got a male partner uh, mm-hmm. so I joined a female uh angel network group specifically to invest in female founders um which makes sense from a business development point of view because i'm out there and um you know meeting female founders but actually that's also where my heart is just to try and um you know support uh you know the sisterhood of struggling uh you know startup um entrepreneurs uh, out there that otherwise don't get the support so I don't want to work full time because I want that work that I do you know the investment that will be like a 10-15 year um, sort of thing to come to fruition I need to put the time into that now as well so um, having the variable diary works for me I can you know super boost some things one week and other things in a different week yeah. and in theory also take time off um yeah, you know, tomorrow's task is to take my son to get two teeth taken out. You know, that's in my diary and that's like a work commitment. And I used to feel really guilty about that. I used to really feel like, you know, if I'd taken time out, even to go to the dentist for myself, let alone, you know, kind of for somebody else, then there was sort of a clock in my head where I needed to make it up um, you know, and, and concerned that I was letting people down on the team that I was in or whatever. So now it's just me and Cheer Bear, she doesn't mind. <laughs> Amazing. And what does a typical work week look like for you then? Is it very varied or do you have a structure that you try to follow in terms of the balance you want? I think I could work more towards finding a regular structure. Um, I tend to allow each week to do what it wants to do and see what happens. So I can sit from one week to the next with a completely empty diary, but by the time I get to Monday, it's full. Um, uh, I've just taken on a three day a week for 12 weeks project. So I'm going to have to start managing things but that's because it's new and that's experimenting and um I kind of have a view on it that if I tried to make it happen I probably couldn't anyway I think that's one of maybe the downsides of working for yourself and being the solopreneur you know you are at the behest of other people and Mm. you're only ever prioritized according to their priority list so you know if I was going to say to people I'm only going to be available on a Monday morning uh you know one of my founders would turn around and go well I can only really see you on Thursday night so what are you going to do about that? And then be like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, yes, <laughs> let's let's do that your way instead. Um, so it, yeah, I I have agency over saying yes or no to stuff. Yes, 
uh, but I don't I don't try and force particular patterns but having said that like like my son's dental appointment I do now make sure that I bake in exercise I saw you went off and played tennis the other day so. you know, it was a very popular post on LinkedIn isn't that always the way they, they don't like my serious stuff I'm putting out there but I post a selfie the minute, the the minute tennis you skived, <laughs> yeah, the minute you own up to the fact that you skived and you went to play tennis <laughs> but no, I, I like a whole wholly agree with you that that is so important and I think that's one of my later learnings. My friend has got the idea of the um, tumble dryer and your back brain that there's just always something mm, turning. Oh, yeah, fine. Fine. And I, yeah, so I would, and I think maybe, you know, kind of the poetry taught me this a little bit that if you're like, I need to go to the answer now, you know, you kind of, your brain starts. Whereas if you go off and sort the washing, which I would have felt guilty about doing while I was working, you know, for somebody else, you go off and sort the washing and your bra- brain's kind of churning stuff over. And then you've got the answer when you come back. And it just, yeah. there's a lot more ease in that. But that's because I'm not uh, feeling, I'm, I'm not sure anybody actually constrained me as much as I felt constrained, but I felt the responsibility um, to be working, you know, as harder, if not harder, slightly than everybody else around me, just to make sure that I sort of, you know, earned, I keep and felt my place uh, within a bigger company. Whereas for myself, Cheer Bear doesn't mind. Cheer Bear is very supportive. We all need a Cheer Bear. I did have a little Yoda figure here, which I realised just yesterday I've lost. So that's no good. I need to bring oh. it back. But, uh, yeah, I've lost my little uh, Yoda coach. Um, but that's, yeah, that's very interesting. So obviously different industries have certain ways of working and startup is very fast paced and if they're working long hours they might expect you to do the same but as you said you can still have boundaries within that obviously you can choose not to work with startups but then you can in that yeah. choice still and I always find that people respect that I find that um you know if if you yeah if you're clear about what the boundaries are and you're super willing to obviously bend them as and when needed and so on I think that's um always landed yeah. better than I thought it would because we think oh gosh I've got to and especially when we're younger you know people pleasing and I've got to say yes to everything and that's as we know a recipe for burnout so having that space and time for your son's two teeth and whatever it is 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 pretty important to, yeah. to put that into the diary um, so the one the one hack that I did have while I was still working was I got to a nine day fortnight uh, because I always felt like part time working was going to be impossible. I thought, you know, there's, that you hear from everybody, don't you, that if you do a four day week, you end up working five and getting paid at 80 percent, which who wants that? And I'd heard that from a lot of my friends and hadn't really felt like the roles that I was in were going to be appropriate for a part-time you know so I went back after six months maternity leave and I went in full-time and I just made it work and let's bear in mind that was like five days a week in an office as well like I can't even can't even in my head at the moment figure out how that happened um but then I got told about a nine-day fortnight from a friend who worked in charity which is taking every other Friday off so 90% of your salary obviously your, your holiday gets cut by 10% but you earn these 26 days in a year, which are every other. So actually, because you are there some Fridays, most people oh. think that you work full time. So you don't kind of have that, um, like the part time stigma. And also because you're in some Fridays, you don't fill up your available Friday <laughs> with doing a yoga class and then going for a coffee or I always do the washing on this day or whatever. Like the the, the every other Friday becomes the gift day. Um, and that's so much more prevalent in charity and, you know, in um, mm. government, you know, all of those different kind of working patterns uh, are there. And, you know, this, um, you know, four day working week now, some some organisations have gone to 90 percent rather than 80 percent. And interestingly, a yeah. friend of mine, the whole company finishes at Friday lunchtime. So that's a different way of doing 90 percent, you know. And if you did a 90 percent like that and you never worked Friday afternoon, frankly, who would notice? But then you wouldn't have the benefit of you, you'd have every Friday afternoon off and you'd you'd end up filling that up and you wouldn't feel like you had the time off. So I that was that was the the most that I managed to get kind of that flexibility while I was, uh, you know, in a in inverted commas corporate job um, uh, was to, to do that. Hmm. I think that's, that's not something I've come across before speaking to you about it a while back and I think it's such an interesting because as you say if, if you both in terms of sort of the image in the office or with other people but also your own calendar I guess that's a danger I'm such a, a fan and, and ambassador for remote working and flexible and hybrid but of course if we become used to a four-day work week maybe in years to come everything will kind of have 
got into some kind of status quo there and then the extra day doesn't feel like an extra day anymore does it and it just becomes sort of taken for granted so we need to keep mix things up maybe and but I love that creativity to find what works for you either finishing early or doing every other week and and Suddenly it wasn't in the hairdressers with a laptop that was the difference I yes. could just the hairdressers oh nice yeah I have been doing the lunch obviously but also it's, <laughs> it's quite nice to be away from the wi-fi and I find you know writing and so on and um, yeah, the little anecdote that I think of when you mentioned the domain name, because I think that will um, be so familiar to, to listeners. I've done the same. And it's such a power in taking that first step of getting the domain name. And I know I hinted to you that I was writing another book and I've had that domain name for many a year. Oh, really? <laughs> it's finally um, sort of coming to fruition. So it's that kind of, it's really nice to, obviously there is something there if you're getting the domain name. Um, it, some people may have had that sort of urge to work for themselves for a long time and it might not take the form that we naively thought at the beginning when it was impossible, but it becomes difficult and then done. So there you go. Done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but, um, Working guess, and there's a big pressure to say words of wisdom, but what final sort of leaving thoughts might you have for somebody who listens? Oh, this fractional thing sounds very interesting. What could be a first step for them to explore and, and to take that further? I think there's a lot that you can do. You, this is your advice, Anna. I'm sure I'm only going to parrot back the things that I learned from you, you know, that you can start you can start figuring that out while you're still doing the thing that you're doing and be clear about what it is that you you will enjoy and you're good at and where you've got that network yeah. um, I don't think you could go from day job doing a into fractional doing b um successfully unless you do that overlap you know I don't think b can be very very different from a but I think um yeah I I obviously left and then went oh what will I do and that that process was like a five or six week process yeah. so it is possible and I'm you know my b is not very different from my a but you know there is a a discernment process I think about what what it will be uh, because to be able then to make the fractional work you're not just going out to get yourself one job you're going out to get yourself multiple mm. jobs um perhaps some of which won't start immediately and that you know uh, the resilience of knowing that something will come yes is is you know the key thing you have to really believe it when you when you do it or, or be comfortable figuring it out as you go I mean, I'm still, I'm, you know, people ask me what a chief of staff is and my answer is still, it's whatever you want it to be. Okay, that's good to know. I've always wondered how that's going. <laughs> there seems to be a red thread that you've sort of gone for those choices that allow you to fulfil your potential in all the different directions. So that's that's really... And projects with interesting people. Yeah. And that's, oh, there you go. That's your business plan, right? That's, that's the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. It does sound like it's a bit of a jigsaw to, because, as you say, you suddenly get three days over 12 weeks and then, you know, people always worry about having too many clients, which is a good problem to have, really. Um, but then, you know, and then having sort of the feast or famine and so on. So I think that's maybe something. Getting in the community as well. I mean, I know you support the community, don't you? You know, being being surrounded by people who will have, have been on the journey before. I met somebody at a wedding really early on who was like, right, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know. And oh, I was like, I've not met you before, you know, friend of a friend. Yeah. And, she said, I wouldn't have believed this if you'd have told me where, you know, where I am. But, you know, I'm five years in now. I'm cutting a six-figure salary. I've got, you know, these amazing clients and I'm really happy. And I was like, wow, that seems impossible from where I am. But thanks, you know. Mm. And I, though for me, those people, I found them all over the place. I didn't yeah. join any networks at that point, but I just sort of found them and really clung on to, to any advice that anybody could give me. And also, you know, you're talking to them about it. They might know somebody that can yes. connect you that might need a, a you. And yeah. that's all you need, isn't it? Absolutely. And so where can we read more? Where if we want to get a fractional chief of staff who can do all sorts of things or if we just want to see what that <laughs> looks like in in um, sort of tangible terms, where can we find you? So Cheerful Orange is on LinkedIn and on cheerfulorange.com. Is there a picture <laughs> of Cheer Bear somewhere? Or is he just in a behind the scenes uh <laughs> there? Bear? To add, add uh, Cheer Bear on the list of a of a, of a of, um, happiness or what are those chief happiness officer, something like that he could be. <laughs> Yeah, cheer, I mean, Cheerbo. You've got there. He's Cheerbo. He's unique. He's, he's got a very strong positioning, very strong USP, and he's behind the success. Yeah, knows exactly what he's doing. He, she, yeah. I think, you know, maybe not. Oh, yeah, also they. Who knows? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I don't remember back in the day, and I don't think they, they had genders, the, the bears, did they? Which is I feel like I'm picking up time. homework rapidly at the end of this now. I've got to go off and put some more material on my website and my LinkedIn and work out who Cheerbo is. <laughs> 
Oh, the, he, she, they does a great job, and um, so do you. So, Verity, thank you so much again for stepping in. You, you've been, as expected, a delight, and so many interesting things. I'd love to talk to you for longer, but I'll let you go around the listeners as well. So, thank you so much, and looking forward to seeing how your journey progresses in the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Outside of the 9 to 5 is the book that continues the story from leaving the corporate 9 to 5. It is a practical guide to designing and building a profitable business that gives you freedom, flexibility and fulfillment. Check it out and grab your copy at outsideofthe9to5.com. That's outsideofthe9to5.com.